sure did. Oh, praise the Lord. We are so glad that you're here today. And when you leave, we're going to want you to say, you were so glad you were here today. That's, that's the goal, okay? Now, I don't want you just to be so glad you were here today because of some cleverly composed message. I want you to be glad you were here today because you touched the throne of God, that Jesus touched your heart, that the Word got into you. And, you know, if the Word doesn't get into you, then what's the point, isn't it, you know? When we get the word into us, that's what transforms our lives. That's what changes us. The title of today's message is Love Without Limits 7. Okay, number 7. The subtitle is this. What are you doing with what you've been given? There is a parable in the Bible where Jesus talks about a master who gave his servants various talents. And talents in those days weren't just talents like, you know, musical talent or something like that. They were uh, denominations of money. It was a, it was a, he gave them a large sum of money. And one he gave five talents, and one he gave three talents, and one he gave one talent. Large sums of money. A talent was not a small sum of money. It was a large sum of money. And he said, take these. I'm going to go on a journey, and I want you to take these talents, and I want you to buy, sell, trade, and make gain for me. When I return, we'll settle up. So the master went on his journey, and he came back some time later, and he took accounting for what each servant had done. <clears throat> and the servant who had five talents had invested wisely. He had bought, sold, traded, and he gained five more talents. And the servant that had three talents, he had done the same. He had bought, sold, traded, and he ended up with three talents. And then the servant who had been given one talent, the Lord says, so how about you? He said, well, I didn't do anything with it. I just, I hid it. I put it in the ground. I buried it. The master was very wroth with him, and the master said to him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. You know, the servant had been given something that was of great value, but he had done nothing with what he was given. And when the master came to reckon with him, he said, You should have done something with what I gave you. Something certainly you could have done, but the problem here was that you were too lazy. You were slothful. I want to say this, is that does anybody here believe, does anybody here believe that you have been given gifts of the Holy Spirit? All right. That's an important thing, because I'm going to tell you this, is the gifts you've been given, they are no good at all if they're in your closet on a shelf not being utilized. When the Lord comes back, he's going to say, what did you do with what I gave you? Because he didn't give us the gifts for our personal benefit. God has given the gifts to the church. So if you have the gift of prophecy, if you have the gift of, uh, of, of healings, if you have the gift of the word of knowledge and all these things, you can't keep them within yourself because that's like the servant who buried his talent in the ground. But you have to be willing to use them for the benefit of the kingdom, for the profit of the kingdom. We are the kingdom. God wants us to use what we've been given. There are a lot of people who aren't using what they've been given. And there will be an accounting for that. We've been exploring in the last few weeks the depths of God's love for us as revealed through the scriptures, as revealed through the person of Jesus Christ. We've understood as revealed to us through the scriptures that everything that God created, everything, every action that God has ever taken, every plan that God has ever planned, was all centered around the undeniable fact that God loves mankind and wants to have fellowship with him. God is love. Love must be expressed to another to be fulfilled. God chose to bestow his love upon mankind. Through the creative power of the Lord Jesus Christ, who indeed is God manifested in the flesh... God created man in his own image and in his own likeness so that he might enjoy eternal fellowship with him. There is no other creation on this earth. There is no other animal. There is no plant. There is nothing that has been created that was created in God's image and likeness but you and I. And God created someone like unto himself so that he could have fellowship with them. God wanted to have fellowship with us. And everybody on earth who is not in fellowship with God is out of God's will because his will is that we all have fellowship with him. Before the first molecule was created, you were on his mind. 
You. You specifically. Not just you pejoratively, generally. Not just like you, mankind. You specifically. Yes, he has a mind that is that uh, powerful that, yes, he knew your name before you knew it. Okay? He knew what you would do before you did it. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow before you do it. He knows you intimately more than you know yourself. And he said, and even though I know everything about you, the good and the bad, I still want fellowship with you. That's his great plan. Before the first sin was committed, God had already prepared a sacrifice to pay the price for that sin and to redeem us from eternal separation from God. Now, is everything I stated, is it all found in scriptures? If it's not found in scriptures, I ought to just shut up, but it's found in scriptures. So we're going to look at uh, some of these scriptures. We're going to look at Colossians. That's 1 Colossians, for you beginners. Colossians 1, 15 through 23. Hmm. All right, are you there? I know if you're not there, it's right there. It says this, The Son, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He's the firstborn over all creation, even though... You know, he didn't manifest on the scene until quite a while later, did he? But it's part of the plan. He was in the plan. For in him all things were created, in Christ Jesus. Things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him, for Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So everything in this, uh, uh, you know, in our solar system, in our planetary system, all the planets that are in their their, their, their movement throughout the solar system and they're in a certain rhythm and they're kept within certain uh, 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 you know, paths, all that is kept together by Jesus Christ. And even in the tiniest solar system, even in the tiniest uh, little planetary system of, a, of a, an atom, and it has electrons whizzing around it, all of those things are held together by Jesus Christ. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Without him, everything falls apart. It's all about his power to hold us together. He is before all things and in it all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Now, this is something I want you to notice. It says to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Uh, You know, things doesn't sound like you and me. But really, the all things really is just you and me. Because Christ's blood shed on the cross did not provide any salvation whatsoever for angels. None. His blood wasn't shed for animals who hadn't sinned. His blood wasn't shed for the plants of the earth. But you and I had a problem. We were walking outside of God's will. We were walking separate from God. And he, Christ Jesus, shed his blood so that you and I could be reconciled to the Father. So that you and I could walk with him. Because the whole plan in the beginning, the whole plan of creating us, was all so that he could have fellowship with us. That's the plan. And nobody's going to thwart that plan. Not even the devil who came to try to mess up that plan. He tried to mess up that plan. He got man to use his power of choice and to make a wrong choice. But Jesus came and straightened all that out. He says, now I'm going to give you a new choice. You can choose life. You can choose salvation. So he redeemed all through the blood on the cross. Now it says this, the 21st verse explains a little bit of that. Once you who were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Let's stop there for a minute. He's done all this. He shed his blood so that he can present you before Christ holy and blameless. Here's the thing. Is a holy God cannot have fellowship with that which is unholy. Can't can't do it. They cannot mingle. So God had a choice to make. Either God himself was going to become unholy so he could be on our level to fellowship with us. Or he was going to have to make us holy so we could fellowship on his level. And that's exactly what he did. By the blood of Christ, he washed us from sin. We became holy, acceptable before God, so that we can be in his presence, because the whole plan is all about him being with you and me. That's what it's all about, everything. He wants to have fellowship with us. 
22nd verse. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now, the devil would like to continue to accuse you. But when he accuses you to Christ, Christ says, I don't see that because I see the blood. That's the difference. 23rd verse. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Well, you know what? Uh, This gospel doesn't do the cats and the dogs any good. But those creatures are you and I. And of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the whole story in a nutshell. You were created for fellowship with the Lord. He has done everything necessary for you to be able to enjoy that fellowship with him. And all you got to do is ask. You don't have to die. You don't have to give your life. You don't have to pay some huge price. It's already been paid. All you've got to do is ask. He says, whomsoever will, just let him come. And he invites everybody. Before you ever thought about him in your whole life, before you ever loved him, Before you were even born, he loved you. He loved you. He set his eyes upon you. He made it his number one priority to seek you out, to find you, to save you, to adopt you into his own family, to pour his love upon you, and to give you eternal life so that you would be able to live with him forever in fellowship. All this is for that purpose, that he might have a people that are in fellowship with him, to whom he can pour his love upon. Forever. Forever. That's the whole plan. You weren't someone who he had to deliberate about accepting. He didn't say, well, you? I don't know. I'll think about it. He did not have to hold his nose and say, well, all right, I probably shouldn't, but I'll, I'll accept you if you're really nice. He didn't do that. You were his goal from the beginning. An object's true value is not determined by the price tag hanging from it. Go into any pawn shop and look at the price tag. If you pay the price, you're a fool. Because that's just something, that's a starting point where they say, here, I want $100 for it. They'll take 50, but they're going to ask 100. The value of something is not determined by the price tag hanging from it. It's determined by what somebody's willing to pay for it. That's the value of something. That's what auctions are about. You can say, this painting's worth $10 million. We'll take it to auction. You'll find out what it's really worth. Because it's worth what the highest bidder will pay for it. That's it. That's its value. With that in mind, consider yourself. What if you think of yourself as worthless, hopeless, not really worth God's time? If you feel about yourself that way, then you haven't heard the price that was paid for you. You haven't understood the price that was paid for you because you were bought with the highest price that was ever paid for anything. You were bought with the price of the precious blood of the Son of God, the only unique Son of God. His blood is precious in the sense that there is no other like it. It's not only holy and pure, it's one of a kind. And you were bought with that price. And he already knew who you were before he bought you. He knew what he was getting into when he did buy you. And he still said it's worth it. The highest price ever paid. You are of inestimable, inestimable, that's a hard word to say, worth. In other words, a whole bunch. (laughs) You're of a value that's beyond valuing in the eyes of God. If that can't raise your self-esteem, then nothing can. Nothing can. We've learned that those who accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are set free from the bondage of sin and from the sentence of eternal death. That's true. We've been set free from the law, also, of the Old Testament. That's true. That law that was given to us of commandments and ordinances in the Old Testament. We've been set free from that. We have a new covenant that has better promises. That's true. And it has a new set of laws or commandments, also. Hebrews 8, 6, the King James says this. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry... By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. We have a better contract with God, and it has better benefits to it. There are better promises. Better for who? They're better for us, not for him. Under the old covenant, the Lord had no difficulty keeping up his end of the bargain. The problem was with us. We couldn't do it. The promises that were included in the Old Covenant 
were promises of healing, of protection, of provision, of increase. Those are good promises, but we have better. If healing was promised in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, and the Lord says, I've got this new package for you, like you get at work sometimes. We've got this new benefit package, and it's really cool because you pay less, but we give you way less. Or maybe you pay the same, but we give you less. No, this package is altogether different. This package is altogether better. It's altogether better. And so if healing was promised in the old covenant, guess what? It's promised in this covenant too. Because we have better. So the difference, why would it be better? Well, I'll tell you about healing in the old covenant was physical. In the new covenant, it's physical and spiritual. It's all around healing. It's full coverage. It's full coverage. We have better promises. Our contract is better. And what's more is this, is we are able now to keep our end of the contract before we couldn't do it. All the laws and the ordinances, there were so many, they were so complicated, they were so difficult, we couldn't keep them. So we couldn't possibly come through on our end of the contract. And because we couldn't, we couldn't really inherit all that was in that contract. But now we have a new contract with better promises. And guess what? Our end of it is easier to keep too. It really is. We've been given the power to keep the commandments given under this new contract by the Holy Ghost that lives within us. We've been given the short form this time, something really simple to observe, something far less confusing to keep. Under the old covenant, we had dozens upon dozens of laws to try to remember and figure out. Now we only have two, just two. The first one is the greatest commandment in the Old Testament. He said, I'm going to keep that one. And here's what it is. A teacher of the scriptures came to Jesus and said, teacher, He said, what would you say is the greatest of all the commandments in the Old Testament? What is the greatest commandment? This is Jesus' reply, Matthew 22, 36 through 38. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first, and he says, it's the greatest commandment. You know, he didn't say they're all the same. He said, this one's better than, it's the most important of all. It is the greatest of all of the commandments is to love the Lord your God. That's the number one commandment. And he says in the New Testament, into the New Covenant, he says, I'm keeping that one. You still need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. All the laws and the commandments are boiled down to two things. That's number one. The second greatest commandment is the commandment that Jesus gave under the New Covenant. It's in John 13, 34. How do I know it was a new commandment? Because he said it was a new commandment. He said this, John 13, 34 through 35. He says, a new commandment I give you. A new command. You need to love one another as I have loved you. And so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. A lot of people can't tell that you're a disciple of God because you don't love other people. That's not you unless it's you. You know, Uh, if that shoe doesn't fit, then that's okay. You don't have to wear it. A lot of people don't know that you go to a church with people that you actually love and care about because... You don't seem to really care about them. And that's not showing the love of God. Because the love of God, he says, I've given you two commandments. If you keep part of the law of the Old Testament, you're guilty. But you, but you, you err in one part. You're guilty of the whole law. The New Testament's the same. He says, I just give you two now. You've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And you have to love your neighbors yourself. You have to love your brothers and your sisters. You have to have a love that goes vertical and a love that goes horizontal. And he says, you've got to keep both. You can't just have one and not the other. A lot of people say, I love God, but I don't love people. Well, the Lord says, you're a liar. How can you say that you love God who you have not seen when you don't even love your neighbor who you have seen? There's two commandments, but it's a much simpler thing to keep. Do you know why it's so easy now to keep this law? It's so easy. In the Old Testament, it was all a matter of willpower. Now it's not really a matter of willpower. Now it's simply a matter of tapping into resources that are already in you. Because the Holy Ghost, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost is in you. And that means you have a a, a resource of love within you that is infinite. God has put his infinite resource of love by the Holy Spirit in you. And if you need to love somebody, it's there for you to use if you want to use it. Nobody has an excuse for not loving. What was impossible in the Old Testament has been made possible today. We can keep God's commandments because his command is love. God is the author of love. God is the originator of love. God is the sole distributor 
of the real kind of God kind of love. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God sends his Holy Spirit into your heart. The Holy Spirit that lives in your heart then provides you with that endless supply of God's love so that you'll always be able to keep his commandments in every situation if you desire to tap into those. Romans 5, 5 says this, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. If God's love is in your heart because the Holy Spirit poured it out there, then guess what? You have no excuse for not loving others. Love is important. Faith is important. Hope is important. All three of these are important, but love is at the top of the list. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says this, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. That's indisputable. That's indisputable. The greatest is love. There is no disputation there. It's love. And you can say, but what about this? What? It's, it's love. Love is the most important thing. God has put it at the top of his list. His two great commandments that we are to keep have to do with love. The others, hope, And faith are also important, but they can't function if they're not in the atmosphere of love. Without love, faith has no power. Galatians 5, 6, we looked at last week, and what we learned from that was this. It says, faith which works by love. That word works meant it was energized by love. Real faith, the God kind of faith, cannot work. It cannot operate. It is not energized. It is powerless if it is not energized by love. What about hope? Without hope, faith is impossible. Hebrews 11.1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is the substance of something that's hoped for. If you're not hoping for anything, it's got nothing to give substance to. If faith is the substance of things hoped for, then before you can exercise faith, you have to have an object. You have to have something that you're hoping for. Hope will give you a target to aim your faith at. Faith energized by love will allow you to pray and receive what you're aiming at. Hope needs faith to obtain its desire. And faith needs love to empower it to accomplish the mission. The Bible says that the greatest of these three is love. But why? Why is love the greatest? It's really quite simple. Imagine this. What if there was no God at all, ever? No creator? What would have been created if there was no creator? Nothing. Without God, nothing would exist. Well, guess what? God is love. Without love, nothing would exist. Without love, faith and hope cannot exist. Faith and hope are both offshoots of love. Love is the root. Those are fruit. If you don't have love, the other two don't exist. They don't even work. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 says this. It's talking about the character of love. It's talking about the attributes of love. Let's look at some of the attributes of love. Love is patient. I know, forgive me, Lord, when I'm on the freeway, love is not in operation. (laughs) Love is kind. It's still not in operation on the freeway. (laughs) Sometimes I believe they deserve the horn of correction, and I correct them (laughs) generously. But at least I don't give them the bird of correction like some of you. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. Ooh, you know when you're dishonoring others, that's all that backbiting stuff you do? That's not love. It's not love. It's not self-seeking. It's all about me. That's not love. It's not easily angered. Some people, they're just landmines just waiting to go off. They got buttons on every side. You can push anywhere and they're going to go off. <laughs> I mean, you walk up to some people and it's like, do I clip the red wire or the blue? They're going to blow. No matter what you do, they're going to blow. Just step away. That's because love isn't in operation. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. How can you lose with love? It never fails. Now, this is a small description of the nature of the God kind of love. Within the nature of love itself, we find... Faith and hope, those are part of the nature of love itself. Let me read verse 7 one more time in the New Living Translation, and you're going to see the attributes of love include faith and hope as part of 
the attributes of love. Here's what it says in, in uh, the New Living Translation for verse 7. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Love is full of faith. Faith isn't necessarily full of love. Love is full of faith. Love is full of hope. When you put love, hope, and faith together, you've got something powerful. But love is the greatest of these. Where do you get the God kind of faith? Where does a hopeless person find hope? It comes from a knowledge of God's love. That's where it comes from. It comes from the knowledge that starts with the word of God that tells us what God has done for us, what God has planned for us. And it culminates in actually experiencing God's love in your heart for yourself. You can talk about love, but it's not the same as experiencing love. How do you experience love of God? How do you do it? How do you do it? Well, it's said in the scripture we read earlier that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So the way to experience God's love is to allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart. Right? Now, the Holy Spirit comes into your heart, and it's, uh, uh, it's really supposed to be this way. It's supposed to be that the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and rules in your heart and has full access to every room in your heart. But some of us invite him into a very small closet and lock him in quickly. Don't want any of that to get out. Don't want him to affect the rest of our being. He might mess us up. I've even had some people tell me that they're afraid to let God totally take over because they'd lose their own personality be gone. No, you'll be the best you you could ever be. That's what the difference will be. Because all that junk that's hanging off of you from sin and shame and condemnation, all that junk just makes you look like a dirty version of you. But there's a beautiful version of you that God has underneath all that that he wants to strip away. When you have the love of God in your heart and you have, you've allowed it to operate vertically, you love God and horizontally you love each other, you'll find that faith is right there. You have confidence towards God. Why? Because you're fulfilling the royal law, the commandment to love. When you're fulfilling God's law, you're walking in God's will, and you have confidence before God. And anything you hope for, anything that comes to mind says, I would really like for that to happen. I would like this person to be saved. Any of those things, you go, my God loves me. He loves that person. You know, certainly he hears me. Of course he hears me. He wants to hear me. In fact, he moved everything out of the way in this world just so he could get to me. He did whatever was necessary so that I could be with him. He cleared his schedule so that I could sit with him and talk with him anytime I want. Right? It's true. It's true. Love is the key. God is in us. God loves us. God's given us access to every good thing he's promised to us because he loves us. So love is the key to fulfilling everything that God, through Jesus Christ, has planned for your life. Does the plan stop there? Once I know God's love for myself, is that it? I'm done. God loves me. I'm, I'm great now. No, that's just the beginning. Love will motivate you. It will inspire you. It will even drive you to do the will of the Father. You see, love is not a passive thing. Love is very active. Love is the power of God in us. And love uh, desires to accomplish certain things. And God sent his son to this world because he so loved this world. He was motivated to send his son because he loved this world. Guess what? If his love, that same love, works through you, it will motivate you to reach out to the world because you want to see them saved. God stamped his image upon us. We should desire the things he desires. We should be motivated to do the things he wants to do. We should be co-laborers with him, not wrestling with him. If God's love motivated him to save man, then God's love working through us ought to motivate us for man's salvation too. The second commandment that we've been given is to love others as ourselves. Now, I loved myself enough to care about my eternal destiny. That's why I chose Jesus. Well, you're supposed to love others that same way. I should love my neighbor the same way to say, I'm worried about your eternal destiny. I'm concerned about that too. The church is a saving station. It's a place where we commit ourselves to two important relationships. Our relationship to Jesus, whom we come here and gather together and worship in this place, and our relationship to each other, to our brothers, to our sisters, that we worship together with, that we grow together with, that we encourage, that we support, that we love, that we work together with. 
in God's great plan of salvation because that's what he desires to do. He desires to reconcile the whole world unto himself, and he wants us to participate in that plan with him. And the thing that will cause us to participate isn't just the fact he told us to do it. It's the fact that if his love works through us, we will want to do it. We will be motivated to do it. We'll be driven to do it. God has designed us to be in fellowship with him and with each other and has made no lone rangers. Okay? You're going to find here and there lone ranger Christians. You know what? They're out of God's will. Period. He didn't design us just to be us and him. If you're stranded on a desert island and you're the only one there, you have a good excuse. If you're not, you have no excuse. God designed us to be in fellowship with him and with others. That's how his love works. The pastor's job is to equip the saints, to protect them, to lead them. That's, that's also part of it. But the often forgotten part is the first part, to equip them. See, the pastor doesn't, doesn't equip the saints. You don't train the military so they can sit at home. You train them so they can go out and fight. Okay? You equip the saints not to sit around and become holy statuary in a mausoleum that everybody can come by and look at and, and admire. Wow, you look really good. You equip them so they can go out to the lost and participate in the work of spreading the gospel so that others can be saved because that's God's plan. That's what you equip them to do, to go out. Didn't Jesus do that? Didn't Jesus teach his apostles and the disciples that followed them? Didn't he teach them, go into all the world? He said, come into church and just sit there and look good. He said, no, come into church, get fed, and then go out. Then go out. It matters not what your skill level is. It matters more what your will level is. Do you want to do God's will? If you're willing and obedient, the Bible says you will eat the good of the land. Well, if you're willing to go out and do the Lord's work, if you're obedient to do that, then you will receive great reward and you will receive personal fulfillment. Man is unfulfilled for the very simple reason he's not doing what he was designed to do. If you're a racehorse, you want to run. You like to run. You like it. Nobody has to make you run. You like to run. Well, God designed you to be a co-laborer with him to reconcile the world unto himself. That's what you were designed to do. And when you're not doing it, you're unfulfilled. And you don't know why. I don't know why I'm unfulfilled. I guarantee you, if people are getting saved because of your life, you'll be fulfilled. That'll change your life. When we are doing what we've been made to do, we find fulfillment. And 1 Corinthians 8 or 3, 9 says this. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. We are co-workers. That means we work together with him. We've been enlisted to work with God as co-laborers. And his great plan, the work he's doing, is to save the lost. If you're unskilled in sharing the gospel, you're still responsible for doing your part. Sometimes if you're, uh, you know, if you got during military draft, the time of draft where you are forced to, to serve. Uh, if you're a Christian, some Christians believe that you shouldn't be shooting anybody. So they're conscientious objectors. And they don't let them off the hook as a conscientious objector. They just give them a job as a clerk or in a hospital, right? Well, God doesn't give, let you off the hook. You say, well, I'm kind of shy to witness. He says, there is something you can do in the ministry to promote the ministry so that people can be saved. Something you can do. Everybody has a job. Everybody can do something. Everybody can be co laborers with Christ in reconciling the world to himself. When I first got saved, I knew none of the word of God. None. The gospel was preached to me very simply. Here's a few facts, Tom. You're a sinner. You're lost. You're going to hell. I can offer you a savior who will save you, and you'll go to heaven. I said, that's what I want. I'll take that one. That was the gospel. That was it. That was enough. You know what? I went to school the next day, and I preached the gospel. That's all I knew. I said, hey, you guys are all sinners. You're lost. You need a savior. I got a savior to offer you. You can come to church with me. We'll get you baptized and you can be on your way to heaven. About nine people went with me. Whoa, I was really schooled, wasn't I? I mean, I really, I really had a lot of training to witness, didn't I? You know what? All I had was zeal. I was excited that I got saved. That's all. And I went and told a bunch of people that didn't know any more than I knew. Hey, there's a Savior, and you need him. And they came and saw. Witnessing is really not that hard. A testimony is a good place to start. You can say, I once was lost, but now I'm saved. 
There was that blind man in the Bible that says, you know, I don't know if, if he's a savior or not, but I'll tell you this, I was blind, now I can see. I know that much, right? Yeah. Last week, Lance Broomfield brought a co-worker to church. His name is Kaige. Not Kai, Kaige. Last week when I gave an altar call, Kaige came forward and asked Jesus to forgive him for his sins and to save him. If Lance hadn't brought Kaige, he never would have been saved in this place last week, but he brought him. He just, as a co-worker, he said, why don't you just come and see? Why don't you come and listen? That's all he did. And because of that one action of saying, why don't you just come and see, that man is saved. That man is saved. And I've been communicating with that man this week. I'm going to have lunch with that man. He's excited about being saved. The week before, there was a man who showed up named Howard. And you know what? We gave the simple gospel. You're a sinner. You're lost. You're going to hell. You need a savior. And Howard raised his hand. And Howard came forward. And Howard got saved. Saw Howard today. Howard is a different man. Howard's smiling from ear to ear. I'm having lunch with Howard, too. Howard is so happy. He's so changed. And you know what? I'm going to tell you what. The the statistics are this. For people that are over 60, (laughs) the amount of people that get saved after they're 60 is like less than one-tenth of one percent. Howard's like 65, and he said, I want to be saved. It's never too late to invite a friend. If you tap into the infinite supply of God's love that has been deposited in your heart by the Holy Ghost, then you won't be able to help yourself from having a heart for the lost. It's not usually the preacher himself who goes out into the community and invites everybody to church. It's usually the people in the church who do that. You invite your friends. You invite loved ones. You invite your co-workers. You invite anybody. And you may say, but I don't know how to preach. You know what? Just bring them to church. We'll talk to them. Bring them where they can hear the word of God. That's what happened to most of us. I want you to know that uh, you have an opportunity coming up here. Uh, Elsie Welsh is a really dynamic speaker, really dynamic evangelist, and she operates in the gifts of the Spirit. And Elsie Welsh is coming August 11th. Good time to invite somebody. You say, well, I'm not a good preacher, but I know one who is, and I'm going to bring you to church. Tell the people around you, there's an exciting, dynamic speaker. You've got to hear them. Bring them to church. That's all you've got to do. What would make you want to do that? That's uncomfortable. Love will motivate you to do things like that. Bring a loved one who's not saved. Bring a person who is not walking with the Lord right now, but used to be. Bring people who say they're saved, but don't go to church. Because the way God designed this was no lone rangers. He designed us to be in fellowship in a church. And he designed you to be under the the headship of a pastor who prays a spiritual protection over you. That's the way he designed it. You can not like it, but that's the way he designed it. So bring them. Bring people. Invite them. They can be people who are not committed to a church. Bring them. They can be people, people that never heard the gospel. Bring them. They can be people who backslid. Bring them. Just bring them. Because you actually care about their life. We also have the international dinner coming up on the 24th. You know what? Maybe it's hard for you sometimes to invite somebody to come to a church service because they might be preached at. There'll be no preaching at the international dinner. You can invite somebody to dinner. Why? Because what they're going to find when they come here is that Christians aren't weirdos. Some of us are. But for the most part, We're actually normal people who love God and can show them that we love them too. And they can be drawn by God's love. Drawn by God's love. It's up to us. The invitation doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very, very simple. You remember that woman that Jesus met at the well? And uh, she wasn't sure he was the Messiah at first, but then he started to tell her things about her own life. She's like, whoa, you're, you're that guy, aren't you? You're the prophet, aren't you? And she was amazed that she was standing before Jesus, the Messiah. And what did she do? She went back home, and she reported to people. And you know, she didn't have the gospel yet, did she? But she said this, come and see a man. That's what she said. That was her testimony. Come and see. Sometimes that's the only testimony you need, is to say, wow, uh, I've heard the word of God. It's so spectacular. It changed my life. Just come and see. Come and see. And see what God will do. Why would we do that? Because we love people. 
What if we don't love people? Then it tells you you have a problem in your life. The problem is this. The love of the Holy Ghost is in your heart, but you're not allowing it to affect your actions. You're not letting it into your life. You're locking it in a closet. And when you lock up the love of God, you will not function in the love of God. You will not walk in the love of God. And when you don't walk in the love of God, guess what? You walk in condemnation and your faith doesn't go past the ceiling because you don't feel like you're in right relationship with God. And it goes on and on and on. There's all kinds of problems that occur in our spiritual lives when we're not walking in love. You want confidence towards God? You want to have prayers that are not hindered? Bible even says this. It says, it says that the husband and wife, if they have a disagreement, you know, they better get together on things because so their prayers won't be hindered. Love has to be present there. Love has to be present there. We have to have love present in all of our relationships. If there's somebody we don't love, if there's somebody we actually hate, someone we feel ill towards, we need to repair that breach. We need to allow the love of God to flow through us to them. Uh, I'm not going to name the person, but I saw that happen miraculously this week. Someone who had a really bad thing in their heart about somebody else. And they really had no good intent in their heart. It was all about justifying themselves. But you know what? My wife and I were praying for them. And the love of God hit them. And boom, all of a sudden they started talking. It's like, wow, that's a miracle. Sometimes we don't expect miracles. But that's what we're praying for, isn't it? The love of God hit them, and uh, they talked to me, and you know what? All that, all that unforgiveness and all that stuff is gone now. It's just gone. Now they're walking in faith. They're walking in love. All of us have been given an inf- infinite supply of love if we've accepted the Holy Spirit. And we have no reason not to be able to keep the two commandments, the only two we've been given. And in keeping those commandments, there is great reward and great promise, and you will walk in great faith. Now... I want to say before we close today, if there's anybody here today, like last week there was somebody, the week before there was somebody, is there anybody here today who has not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you have not, Jesus Christ wants you today to come into fellowship with Him. He loves you and He wants you to be in His his eternal kingdom. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, today is the day that you need to do that. And I would ask you to raise your hand so we could pray for you. Is there anybody at all? Raise your hand. I was just about to give up last week and a hand went up. Anybody? All right, I have a second invitation. If you were walking with Jesus, but you haven't been walking with Jesus for a while, you've backslidden, you're not in right fellowship with him, then I want to pray for you too. Anybody? Anybody? Raise your hand if that's you. That's you. Lord, hear our prayer. All right. Yes. Adele. Come on. Lord, give our sins. Good job, Adele. As we call on your name, All right. would you make this a place mm. for your Thank glory you, to so dwell? Yes, okay, all right. right. So we're going to pray for your your strength and your new kingdom. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just ask you right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to just fill Adele's heart with your power, with your love, with your strength, Lord, and to drive out all fear and all doubt and all unbelief. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive her, Lord, as she right now is confessing her sins. Forgive her for those sins and wash her clean from them and restore to perfect fellowship with you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I ask you to give her the strength to be committed today, Lord. From now on, Lord, to serving you with all of her heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I thank you for what you're doing, and I thank you, Lord, that you receive all that comes to you, and you forgive all that asks. In Jesus' name. And Adele, are, are you willing to make a commitment to him today to walk? Oh, yes, yes. I, 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 yeah, yeah, I mean, yes. I've okay. never left. You're going mean, to walk in fellowship. That's right. He's never left you, but you have been walking. I have, yeah, I have a lot of practice. You want to commit to begin to walk with you? Yes, to be. Yes, so love the way to laugh. Because I was once in love. Absolutely. I sometimes feel. All right, Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit is within all of us, and we ask you to shed that love in Adele's heart right now. 
and fill her up with that love for you and for others. We know she does that, Lord. She'll even love us up. And we thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name. God bless you. All right. Now, I want to pray a prayer over the rest of us. We don't want to just be hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word. And if you don't want to be a doer, you really need this prayer. Because it's God that works through us both to will and to do his good pleasure. A lot of us have gotten to the will part, but not to the do part. Okay, I want to do God's pleasure, but I'm not going to do it. We need to move on into the doing part, reaching out to the lost, walking in love towards each other and towards God. Let's bow our heads. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you for your word, which is able to break every yoke, Lord. We thank you for your spirit, Lord, which is a spirit of love, Lord, a spirit of love that, Lord, empowers us by your spirit to do everything you've asked us to do, Lord. And it motivates us to want to do it and to do it with cheerfulness, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, that right now, Lord, we're asking you to remove from our heart everything that's an obstacle to us, Lord, that's keeping us from walking in love, that's keeping us from doing your will. Every offense that we've harbored in our heart, Lord, we just reject that right now. We say we forgive in Jesus' name because of the love of the Holy Spirit that's within us. And we ask you, Lord, to forgive us for our trespasses, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that right now we ask you to to give us the courage to step out and to do that which we previously were afraid to do and speak to the lost and invite the lost and see others saved because we know that that's your great plan for this world, Lord. We thank you for empowering us and giving us boldness as the apostles prayed for. We we, we thank you that you give us boldness this day and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and we will see you next week.